my name is David Snyder. Welcome to Lie to Me If You Dare, how to, uh, the art and science of lie detection. Now, my approach to lie detection um, is a little bit different than if you were to go to a uh, kinesic interview or interrogation class or uh, even, re even some of the books on it. I'm going to use my sound system in the next one because this one keeps fading in and out. Um, I'm a certified hip master hypnotist. I'm, a, I'm an expert in conversational hypnosis. I've authored over 15 different uh, products on applications of conversational hypnosis. I consult on a regular basis to a large number of uh, personal injury attorneys on how to win juries and influence people. I also do personal contracting work where people literally uh, sometimes hire me to go into various situations and exert influence on people. Uh, I run a clinic in Solana Beach, California, where my specialty there is treating organic physiological illness that has as its root repressed emotion. I'm a certified trainer and master practitioner in neuro-linguistic programming under the founder, Dr. Richard Bandler. And I've been teaching and training hypnotists, I was in fact teaching and training hypnotists in the art and science of social influence and its related disciplines, as well as hypnotherapy, for over 10 years for free uh, in Los Angeles before I ever started offering to certify anyone. I've done a tremendous amount of, of research and <laughs> fun with this particular discipline. And to me, hypnosis and its related disciplines and lie detection, AKA kinesics or body language is one of those, is a life skill. We don't get anything done unless we can get other people to do something for us or, or with us or to us or what have you. So one of the things that we need to understand is most of us don't have the bandwidth, the time and the energy to go into up to, the, up to your knees or up to your neck or however deep you want to go into this, into the study of lie detection. So one of the things that we need to understand is how can we, or what skills can we develop that allow us to actually figure out what a set of body language cues mean. And the reason I'm, I'm gonna talk about that real quick is because if we don't understand the continuum in which all human behaviors and kinesic expressions fall, we don't really have much to work with. Does that make sense? If you look at a body, how many of you ever, ever bought a book on body language? How many of them do you remember? Yeah, exactly, right? So if you wanna get good at body language, it's not about the books. It's about observing human beings in their natural habitat, okay? Now the interesting thing, one of the, the more hidden sides of body language is what I call the mind-body feedback loop. How many people here have ever heard of a, a woman by the name of uh, Amy Cuddy? If you haven't, Google her, find her TED Talk, and memorize everything she says. Cuddy, C-U-D-D-Y. C -U -D -D -Y. The video is titled Power Poses. Power poses, okay? Now, keep in mind what I'm about to share with you. I was teaching in more advanced ways for over 10 years. That, this really kind of stinks, doesn't it? Okay, uh, I was teaching for over 10 years before her study came out. But as a primer, as a, a way to really understand where I'm coming from in terms of what we're gonna be covering here in the next couple of hours, power poses is a really, really good introduction. Because what Amy discovered was what I call the mind-body feedback loop. When we think about body language, and specifically in the context of lie detection, we'll get into that in just a moment, when we start thinking about body language, we always look at, well, what does a, a certain posture or a certain configuration of the limbs actually mean, right? It's natural. But we never stop to think about, when I take on a certain posture, what happens to my brain? What, what effect does it actually have on the person holding the posture. We automatically assume that if a person's standing a certain way, they're thinking a certain way. But what if, you as therapists especially, what if we changed how they were standing? Well, what Amy discovered in her studies was that if you hold certain poses for as little as two minutes, your entire hormonal balance will shift. She, she, she started having people work with what they call power poses, very alpha dominant authoritative posters. And saying, so you know, the, the, uh, everybody who wins something does this, right? Even blind people, who've never, who, when they, the minute they have a success, 
You could be in New Guinea, you could be in Australia, you could be in Europe, and they all go, even Stevie Wonder, right? They're archetypal, they're hardwired in to the human nervous system. It doesn't matter what part of the world you're from. If you go through a, a victorious state, you will automatically assume certain postures. Conversely, if I hold this posture consciously for as little as two minutes, your testosterone can go up by as much as 25%. Not only does your testosterone go up, your cortisol level goes down, which means you become more dominant, more alpha, more, more charismatic, and a heck of a lot more relaxed. Which brings us to lying. There is no trait on the planet or that a human being exhibits on the exterior that indicates deception. It just isn't there. Okay? And especially, and it's especially true when you're dealing with people who may fall into the psychopathic, sociopathic, or sometimes narcissistic ranges. Their behaviors are completely off the charts. Okay? Because they learn to mimic emotion more than anything else. Most of the deception indicators that you will, will be covering or talking about or touching on fall into basically either a visual or an auditory component. Okay? Uh, we're going to be talking about the fundamentals of how to observe and calibrate body language. Now, this is not an NLP sensory acuity class. Okay? The problem that we have with a lot of um, like NLP-ish approaches, and I, you'll hear me bag on NLP left and right. Okay? So I'm an equal opportunity hater. You know, um, a lot of times we, it's too much information too quickly. Too, hello, too quickly, too quickly. Okay. Um, I'm almost wondering if I should just go it out, but... No, no. no. <laughs> okay, that's good. Next time I promise you I will bring mine. My, I have a sound system in my room. It's pristine, it's beautiful. It's not intermittent. I was bitter, but I'm over it now. Okay. <laughs> Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. This is where we start to get out of hypnotist mode. Everybody look to the person immediately to your right, immediately to your left, stick out your hand, look him in the eyes and go, Boo! Yeah, be good at it, have fun with it! Do it! All right, very nice. All right, I've just dispelled two, room, two minutes. All right, two problems that we have. One, the fear of making a fool of yourself. And B, I can't in fact get hypnotists to do anything I want, even if they don't want to. <laughs> All right, now, here's what I want to show you. Can I actually sit down? God damn it! <laughs> I can't take notes anymore. No. Okay, probable things. This means I know the answer. This means I don't. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Yes, this means, oh shit, I hope he doesn't call on me. <laughs> right? This means yes. This means no. There will be a test. <laughs> if profanity, foul language, blunt talk, or an occasional sexually inappropriate metaphor offends you, there's a fucking door. <laughs> okay? I want to share something with you guys, just because, um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing, I, I mentioned at the beginning of today's, today's talk that I've offered over 15 different products on conversational and covert hypnosis. And it's ironic, really, because if you come to my covert hypnosis class or my conversational hypnosis class, the first half day is on nothing but state control. How to utilize your physiology to put the whammy on people without saying a word. Okay? There is tremendous, tremendous power in the physiology of the human body to influence the states of other people. If you want to check on the reference work behind this, there's a, a, a website called heartmath.org. The human heart radiates an electromagnetic field eight feet in diameter that is measurable with instruments from the human body. Therefore, at the, ex at the most basic range, you can be within 16 feet of somebody and train your nervous system to theirs, shift your state, and they will follow. Once you know what that entrainment feels like. Okay? And for those, how many people have been, have been in one of my CPI or STL classes? If you don't believe me, 
talk to these people. Okay? It's voodoo. All right? But once you understand how it works and you feel when the sensation hits, any emotional state that you go into, their nervous system will track you. Okay? So if you're really good at eyes open hypnosis for yourself, and you can train with a nervous system and go into an eyes open state of hypnosis yourself, guess what happens to them? Okay? It can't not happen. It's based on the law of physics, not psychology or new age stuff. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. What I want you to do right now is I want you to close your eyes, if you will. I want you to remember a time in your life when you felt absolutely amazing. Just absolutely amazing. Now, I'm going to give you some parameters just so we get really goal-oriented and focused and successful. I want, you to, I want you to add some parameters. Make it something that you saw what you wanted. You decided then and there that you wanted it to the, at the very bottom, you know, the deepest level of your mind, body, and soul. You made a plan. You put that plan into operation, and you nailed it. Home run. Touchdown. Big time. Ah, yeah, baby. Right? And I want you to remember what that felt like. As you do that, I want you to stand the way you were standing. I want you to breathe the way you were breathing. Let those feelings come flooding back into you. As you let those feelings come flooding back into you, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. A, point to where you feel it in your body. Go with your first impression on this. Excellent. Very good. Now, notice there's a color connected to that feeling. Pay attention to what that color is. And as you pay attention to that color, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice it's moving. It's spinning in a certain direction. I want you to pay attention to what happens to the feelings in your body as that, that energy, that spin, begins to speed up. Begins to amplify. Be faster and faster and faster. Notice what happens to your body. And just let it continue to build with every breath and every beat of your heart. You just allow it. I have to turn my mic down. That's okay. That's still that was way too down. Okay, now, without changing anything, ladies and gentlemen, not your posture, not your breathing, nothing. Try to feel bad. Notice you can't do it. Now open your eyes, look up here. Have a seat. Interesting. Here's what I talk about, what I mean when I say the mind-body feedback loop. Every emotional state that you experience has a corresponding physiology. Yes, sir? That better? Okay. Every physiology has a corresponding state. It's a feedback loop. That means you can inject change at any part and create the other part. Most of us, when we start to practice state control, which when you're going to do lie detection, you better have it in spades. Okay? Because when you start to understand some of the tactics that liars use to get out of being caught, it's going to go right to your state. It's going to go right to your ability to put emotion aside, or at least dissipate it, or deal with it in a way that allows you to pay attention. Because when you're, when all lies, all, all deception cues are based on stress. They're based on neurological arousal. Okay? Now, as hypnotists, whether you're doing this overtly in a therapeutic situation or in a negotiation or in a business meeting or an interview or even, even on a date, uh, you gotta know what the heck you're, you gotta be able to function, right? kind of open loop myself for a minute there. It'll come back to me in a minute. Um, you gotta be in control of your state. Otherwise your state will control you when stress hits your system, your neocortex, your rational lying brain shuts off. Okay? All deception indicators are, all, are, are, all the, are, all, are stress indicators. When you start to focus on catching someone in a lie, you literally have to write this down Ignore the truth. Or ignore what's true. You have to become a bulldog in your, in your lust to detect deception. 
okay? But you also have to be able to maintain your emotional state. The fastest, most tactical way to do that is through your posture and your physiology, not your willpower. Your willpower is a finite resource. It's based on two things. It's based on the amount of glucose in your system and the amount of sleep that you've had. Anytime you have to suppress an emotional response, you burn up willpower units. When the willpower units are all gone, you default to hedonistic, pre-programmed, unconscious behaviors. This is why most of the people's diets fail, because they're not equipped to deal with suppressing emotion that they have to deal with on a, on a constant basis. So when you start to just make the decision, and how many people here are therapists? Raise your hands. Are. Are. Okay. How many people here are lying about it? Would like to be practicing. <laughs> I have classes on that, by the way. I'm sorry? I paid clients. You know what? I, hip I hypnotized probably thousands of people for free before I ever took a dime. That doesn't mean it's okay. Okay, you guys worked hard for your certifications. You deserve to be paid for the good work you can do. But that doesn't mean that you know anything with a pulse is open, right? Well, <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a pulse, they have other problems, right? <laughs> okay, um, so when we talk about lie detection, it, a lot of what we're going to, a lot of it's going to be about understanding states. Body language is based on the psycho-emotional state you're having and how the physiology is expressing it. If we can put somebody in certain physiologies, it actually becomes harder for them to lie. Okay, that's little tactical stuff. We'll, you might be able to touch on that later. We want to get into the basics first. First things first is when you start, when you realize that somebody could potentially be lying to you and you want to find out the truth, you literally have to ignore the truth. It's like trying to edit something you've just written. You ever notice that uh, like after you write something, you go back and you start from the beginning and you, you try to edit, you go back and everybody who reads your stuff afterwards find all the shit you missed? It's because your brain fills in stuff. Your brain rationalizes, it creates plausible scenarios in your, in your mind that could be true. A lot of times, people don't get away with lies because they're good liars. They get away with lying because we really want to believe them. And that's why you have to really make a decision when you're going to start employing some of these tactics. How far down that rabbit hole do you really want to go? What are the, relationship, what are the, what are the ramifications of pursuing that? Right? A lot of people, and I, I deal with a lot of people who step outside their marriage on a regular basis and things like that. Trust me, there's a lot of things that we just don't want to know, even though there's part of us that does. Right? So, when we decide, when we make the decision, ignore what's true, focus only on the discrepancies and the inconsistencies, like a pit bull. Okay? The next thing we want to notice, we want to, we want to start talking about, is what we call baselining. Now, how many people here have ever heard the term baseline? It's not free basing. Okay? <laughs> Baselining is what's normal. How do these people normally behave? What's their normal posture? What's their normal body orientation? That's really where we want to start. Okay? No single body language cue means anything. Okay? So the first thing we have to look at is what are they normally doing? If I'm talking to this young lady and she asks me where I was last night and she happens to be my significant other and I go, what do you mean? I told you where I was, right? If my normal way of speaking is this and all of a sudden this happens, I just gave her the second thing we have to start looking for. A, I deviated from my baseline, but I also did what we commonly refer to as several body language cues within a five second window. It's called clustering. Okay? Not to be confused with other cluster hyphenetic word you guys know about. Right? No behavioral cue becomes indicative of anything unless there's two, at least two of them or more. And they have to happen usually within a five second window. Now, when I talk about lie detection being an indicator of stress in the body, that's exactly what I mean. It's very, very difficult for us to keep track of our stories. The hardest lies to catch are the ones most close to the truth. Okay? That's the, 
hardest lie to catch. The bigger the emotional payoff, or the less time a person has had to prepare, the more deception leakage you're going to have. In other words, the more stressed out they're going to get, and the more holes you're going to find in their story. Okay? So when we start to talk with people, we have to look at, first and foremost, what do they do under normal situations? Now, if we're, if we're trying to do a covert interrogation, we need to start asking questions that are non-threatening, very matter-of-fact, and can obviously be true. Right? In, uh, in some of my persuasion courses, I have this thing we call the Three Magic Questions Protocol, 3MQ. It has three categories of question, and depending on what context you're in, uh, I have lawyers use this to make expert witnesses waive their attorney-client privilege. Uh, I have people, uh, I have young ladies who uh, go out and put the whammy on guys out front 10 years younger than them and have wonderful relationships. Uh, I, have, I, do, I use this actually when I enroll clients into my, either my, my private practice or, uh, or my trainings. So 3MQ is a very, very useful framework for creating very, very intense connections with people in a non-threatening, very guided way that's very organic. And it goes like this. It goes location, occasion, uh, passion, career, and then history, our family, childhood history. Who were your friends? Where'd you go? Where'd you play at? Now, why is this important? Because when we start asking questions like this, we're going to start to generate pleasure responses. We're going to start to generate very, very um, useful information that we can use as a baseline, right? especially the location occasion questions. You start asking people, what do you think of it? You know, what do you think, you know, if you're at a wedding reception or a bar, uh, what do you think of the drink specials? What do you think of the band? And they give you an honest opinion. That's where you can begin to calibrate honest answers. So they have no reason to lie. They're not vested, right? It's very conversational. It's very easy going. Uh, and it gives you that baseline information that you want to start to work with. And you've got to remember this stuff. You've got to remember, this, this is one of the reasons why I lied. It. First of all, the best lie detectors in the world are about 60% accurate. They're just not that good. Yes, sir? So, when you're in location, what do you use the term, what do you think of? You ask them, what do they think of? Yeah, it's an opinion on? question. But of what's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, work? because most people, when, they, when, they, when they're moving through the world, they're in one of several compound states. Okay? They're either inside their head or they're outside their head. They're either internal or externally oriented. Does that make sense? Depending on what direction they're focused, they can also either be associated or dissociated. In other words, they could be in their head making pictures that they're feeling intensely, completely in their own head, or they're watching a movie in their head that maybe not have anything to do with them, but they're kind of distanced from it. Right? If, if we want to interact with people, we want to manage the direction of attention as well as pay attention to how their body language, their facial cues, their body orientation, their postures shift as the topic comes closer and closer to things that are more emotionally provocative for them. I like this because it tends to create uh, a very strong connection with you. And one of the things that happens when people create strong connections is it becomes very hard to defend against your influence. It becomes very, very difficult to analyze what's being said, A, because you don't want to, and B, because you want to, your, your system wants to actually connect at a deeper level. So when you get things, first of all, they're much more likely to tell you the truth even though they didn't want to when you do this. This is crazy stuff. This is how powerful this is. But when they do lie, the effort is so hard that you will see a massive physiological shift in them just to be able to tell the lie. It becomes extremely obvious when you apply this framework because you've engendered states that they have to break away from to lie. They literally have to break their posture. Yeah. At, at some point, could you address, you said the, the lies, um, things closest to the truth are hardest to detect, but people say the big lie is actually hard to yeah, detect. Yeah, that was the other one. Is it, 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 repeat the question, which was, oh, the question was, um, he's, uh, he, his question was, uh, I said, I'm not used to the signage thing, uh, <laughs> pattern interrupt, right? Um, I said that the hardest lie to detect, the almost perfect lie is the one most closest to the truth. But there are other people who say the big lie 
is the hardest one to catch. And that was actually one of the tactics the Nazis used, is every time they got caught in a lie, they told a bigger one, right? It turns out it kind of worked too, right? The idea here is, if you think, of, if you think about spin, the, the term spin, right? You take a few facts and build a story around it, it has absolutely nothing to do with the actual factual elements, right? And can it be big? Yeah, as long as there's a few things in there that are true, the conscious mind will just say, okay, in fact, there's, there's some diabolical Ericksonian-based techniques that are, that are worked around this neurological principle. Uh, in fact, uh, on Sunday when I'm doing instant conversational hypnosis, uh, we'll probably be working with some of that diabolical stuff. Teaser, teaser, teaser. Anyway. Um, but the three magic questions is, is very, very simple. Location, occasion. What brought you here today? Who are you with? You know, what do you think of X, Y, Z? Nothing that can be answered yes or no. Okay, we want qualitative answers, right? We want them engaged. Even a good interrogator. Um, when he's going in there, uh, he, will, he, will, he will only resort to ma manufacturing stress in that environment as a last resort. He will foment communication, he will create connection. Remember, everybody in the interrogation room is looking for an ally. They're looking for somebody to believe in, even if they hate you. They're desperate for, for an ally somehow, some way. And so an interrogator will, and I'm trained in kinesic interview and interrogation, by the way. I studied, I, I was going through this weird phase in my life where I had to make a choice. I, had, I was simultaneously doing uh, pre-med and uh, law enforcement. And I looked at the stress level that cops have and how much they make and promptly chose healthcare. But, uh, but I was fascinated by the, by the program. I've always been fascinated by human behavior. So when you do these things, um, I, I keep open looping myself. I hate when I do that. Um, what was the last thing I said before I started talking about my, my aborted career in uh, healthcare or in law enforcement? Yes, no question. Yeah, we want qualitative answers because the more information they give, the more engaged they become, the more attracted to you they get. We want to make it as difficult for people to lie as humanly possible, right? So this is something that if you don't know, the, even if you don't know the person, within, within 15, this has been tested within 15 minutes, you can have an intense, deep connection bordering on love if you follow this protocol. It's just not fair, okay? Can you just talk about the patient? Well, it starts here because it's non-threatening and it's superficial and it activates the neocortex. Like a vacation? Uh-huh. Well, if you're on, wherever you're at, what's in the environment? Like, I keep talking about my freaking intermittent radio, right? Every time I do, you look at the radio. Or not the radio, the, uh, the transceiver, right? What's going on in the environment? You have to be out, you, you have to be out of your head and in the world, too, right? You have to know what their baseline is. And one of the things I look for a lot is pupil dilation. I have noticed... You have to test this. I have noticed that when people start to lie, their pupils tend to shrink. Okay? And it, 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 by itself, it means nothing. All right? But when you see that distance, that, that closing down of the pupil, what's going on is they're actually looking at what they're saying through a microscope. They're analyzing what you just said, looking for all the possible ways to circumvent, and then analyzing what they're going to say, and then coming back. If you know anything about NLPI accessing cues, you'll see their eyes dance all over the map. But again, it doesn't mean they're lying to you. Deception is based on stress. The more stress you can invoke, the more rapidly leakage will begin to happen. Now, you will simultaneously get visual cues and auditory cues. This is where the challenge really starts to come in because most of us can only pay attention to one thing at a time. Right? And usually it's our words, unless the, the body language shift is really, really out of proportion. So that being said, what I want to give you now, and besides, there's so many different body language cues, how do you keep track of them? You just can't. But if you understand the spectrum in which all body language movement falls within, you can start to, based on a few basic ideas, extrapolate what a certain posture means. So the first thing I want you to understand is you have three brains. You have your, your paleocortex, your limbic system, and the neocortex. Your neocortex is the rational lying brain. It's the part of you that makes up stories to justify acting on what, you want, on, on the, other, what the other two want to do that have nothing to do with what's actually the real reason you want to do them. Okay? In hypnotherapy, we call this the presenting problem generator. Okay? The people who walk into your clinic, they tell you what their problem is, you regress the cause, it's almost never the thing they came for. You ever notice that? Okay. It's not that it's not connected, it's just there's so many different oblique connections and things like that that until you actually provoke the emotion to follow it right back to the initial sensitizing event, 
you could spend all day at that surface level and never get the thing handled. Right? People lie to us all the time. We lie to ourselves all the time. Okay? People are in your chair because they're lying to themselves more often than not. Okay? Now, I need two volunteers, and anybody who can come on up. You've, come on up. Great, I have a male and female component. This will look really good on camera. Oh, I have two females. Oh, wait, everybody's coming up. They're rushing the stage. Come on up. Okay, this is fine. Now, uh, back to back, please. Now, this is very cool, all right? What is your name, miss? Katie. Katie, I'm David, and this is? Kim. Katie and Kim. <laughs> Alliteration. All right, so I need to uh, spread out just a little bit. Now, what you're seeing is zero rapport. Their backs are to each other. They're oriented in a completely different direction, right? The reptile brain moves towards pleasure and away from pain. This behavior will happen at every level of human experience and human expression. If we can't completely move away from something, we will try to move apart away from something. If we can't move apart away from something, we will try to verbally or uh, vocally move away from something. Does that make sense? So the rapport continuum starts here. There's no affinity here whatsoever. As people become closer to connected, whether that connection is physical in terms of distance or, or close in terms of energy, right, in terms of their, their consciousness, what they believe in, beliefs, ideology, whatever, then this will start to happen. Now they're neutral. You understand the distinction? Neutral. Two things will begin to happen mostly. Proximity will change. <laughs> Orientation. Well, I didn't use the Kuzun report. That's a little much, right? But this is what I mean. If you, I call this the mating dance. Literally, this is how all this is literally, and this is a, this is, hey, this is, I'm from California, it's cool, all right? Um, but this is literally, if you ever watch two people, in a, a male and female approach each other in a bar, what's the body language position? There's the bar, there's the guy. <laughs> yeah. Now, who's more invested in this relationship? Who has all the power? Right? As people move from complete stranger to intimacy, Orientation and proximity change. <laughs> okay? Give these ladies a big round of applause. Thank you. It's a, uni it's a constant. It's a constant. And if you get the principle, anytime you see a human being, if you, you, you interact with a human being, or you see two or more human beings interacting, you will be able to extrapolate the rapport dynamic Who's more invested? Who's the prize? Who's the dominant? Who's the submissive? Who's the subordinate? Okay? And when, they sh when the rapport breaks and when it intens intensifies. That's why I showed you this. Other otherwise, we could show you, well, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. Now let's extrapolate that a little bit more. Uh, Peter, come on up here. Elmer, come on up here. We'll do, we'll do two men together now, right? <laughs> All right. So, um, one of the things that happens when people fall into rapport is they will orient on one particular person. Okay? If I'm the rapport leader, this happens. Look at their feet. The feet will always orient towards the rapport leader. When you're detecting lies and you ask a question that triggers a stress response, watch their feet. Because the feet are the furthest away from the face. It's a lie that people can, can't look you in the eye and tell a lie. Okay? It was, that was a lie created by liars. Okay? <laughs> we have the most control, the most control over our face. But the feet, ah, nobody thinks about the feet. Right? And you'll see a lot, one of the dynamics that you, have, you see a lot of is I'll be talking like this and I'll be getting nervous. Right? <laughs> Look at my lower body. What's my lower body doing? Sure, I'm, 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 looking, I'm going to gnaw my arm off to get away from him. Right? Yes? Are these cues also true of sociopaths? No. No. 
And the reason I say that is because sociopaths don't feel guilt. They don't, they don't, they mimic emotion. Unless they're really, really stressed or really, really in pain in some way, and they have a very, very a high negative reinforcement threshold, uh, they will not give a lot of the same cues. Okay? Because they don't get stressed out, because they don't feel that the rules apply to them. What will happen more often than not is they'll actually kind of get happy um, when they lie. It's called duping delight. Okay? And, and the whole thing is, is if you understand microexpression, which is a little bit more micro than I want to get in terms, no pun intended, a little bit more micro than I want to get in terms of, of understanding, because they don't mean the person's lying, it just tells you that they're experiencing or suppressing a certain emotion. But what we want to look at first and foremost is where do the feet orient? Okay? If I'm really into what's going on, I'm going to get this. If he says something that I really don't want to talk about, two things will happen. A, uh, by the way, this is also called anchor point movement. It's a, actually, if you, if you get the book Spy the Lie, they have a great glossary in the back of that book. Anchor point movement means whatever I'm using for support. If it's my feet, my butt, if I'm sitting, or my hands if I'm leaning on something. If he asks me a question like, were you with my wife last night? I thought I saw your car outside my house. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I, was home, I was out bowling. Right? That's only one sign. You need two. Right? Oh, it was, actually, there was two. I shifted it away, and I moved my foot. That's two. See how fast? By the way, what happened to my torso? What do you mean? I put a block up. I put a barrier between him and me. Yes? What asking the question Yes. Yes, in order for me to lie, it's very, very hard for me to lie, especially if it's somebody that... Uh, who, whose good graces I want, it's much harder for me to lie when I'm actually in the same physiology and I know I'm lying. So that question you just asked about whether you want to change you, if you have two friends together, even if they haven't cheated on the floor, you would, yes. Like That's right, but that would give me an indication do I need to dig deeper? Remember, you are not going to get the truth with one question. All right. Yes. With all these like signals and stuff, what is the difference between just being like defensive and lying? Because you can be defensive without lying, and you can be like very good question. Break the rapport and like step back. Mm -hmm. What's uh, it's Kate? Right. Yeah. Uh, Kate asked the question: What's the difference between being defensive and being deceptive? Well, one often leads to the other, right? Or one is a reason for the other. I'll give these guys a big round of applause. <laughs> but it's a good question, so let me address it. There's this phenomenon in kinesics we call Othello's error or Othello's flaw. And this is why baselining is really, really important. If you don't have a baseline, you don't have anything, okay? Othello's error or Othello's flaw Remember, all deception indicators are signs of stress. So if somebody's already on the defensive, it's going to be very, very difficult to tell necessarily without digging really probing questions um, if it's due to just the nat their natural way of expressing themselves or if they're actually lying to you. This is why the baseline is so important. If you know somebody is naturally a little bit on the anxious side, then it's always a good idea to go back to the three magic questions, establish a non-threatening communication and then slowly, tangentially, work our questions into the dialogue. Yes? What is your posture and as an interviewer or assessor uh, during that process that gives them not only to receive you, but that you get in tune with them? I'm going to match their physiology. Okay. And, and we have some really cool drills that we do. Um, and uh, if we have time, I don't know if we have to take a break, we'll, we'll do some of these drills. One of, the, one of those drills is where you actually hold a conversation and you have diametrically opposing viewpoints. You pick a very polar topic and you have to maintain your point of view and try to convince the other person while matching and mirroring them. And what people discover is that within a very short time they can't, they just give up because the physiology overwhelms your psychology and you just start looking for ways to compromise and agree. So, there's a myth, and I'm going to dispel this here, that when people know you're using rapport techniques, that if they know you're using them and they call you on it, and you, uh, that it will break rapport, only if you cave and, and stop doing it. 
I call this reality frame override. If you continue to match and mirror them, they cannot beat the laws of physics. Okay? There's, I have a video I'll show later on. It's, I have 40 distinct metronomes, all oscillating at different rates. Within four minutes, they all synchronize. Okay? Your nervous system is no different. In fact, it, it happens faster. But people, when the physiologies are in entrainment, they want to move towards compromise. They want to move towards connection, which makes it very hard to lie. In fact, when they do lie, they will physically break the rapport connection between you. They literally have to change their posture to set up a defense to it. So establishing the baseline isn't just about what you hear. It's more about establishing that, that physiology. Yeah. That's why I was asking, mm -hmm. what, do, what do we need to be doing? You, know, you need to, again, you need to put the client, you need to put the client or the subject in a state of ease or, or at least normal. What's normal for that person? And you need to make sure that you know what is normal for that person, right? You know, if they normally stand slouched, right, then that's your baseline. You know, you say something potentially provocative and, and they, they step back or they straighten up or they, they, they put up something that distances them either physically or symbolically, then you have a deviation from the baseline. Does that make sense? Okay. When you look at the rapport continuum, again, where are their feet pointing? Do the feet, I should have a chair for this. Someone give me a chair. Thank you, Omar. One of the things you look at, I like feet. It's not a fetish thing. One of the, uh, the, the feet will, sometimes they'll start to bounce, which we all know is nervous energy, right? Well, if nervous energy wasn't there a minute ago, right? If, that's a, if that starts to happen, okay, we've got some level of stress going on. Now we start to probe, why are they stressed? We start to ask questions that move us towards that. Maybe sometimes the feet will actually move behind the chair. You'll see this a lot. The, ch the feet will retreat, right? You'll see blocking gestures. Blocking gestures could be a cross, arm cross, right? There's this, there is, and, and each of these can, by themselves is one cue. But if I'm, if I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm having a conversation with this young lady, and she asked me, didn't I see you with my daughter at the drive-in last night? And I go, no. <laughs> right? <laughs> it jumps right out at you, right? Right? And I'm making them big, but the, trust me, when, when, you, when, when you, you know, you're having this great, wonderful conversation, and everything's going fine, and all of a sudden that comes out of left field, now you can start to play a little bit. Does that make sense? We want to make these things big. We have to, and we have to decide, do I really want to know the answer? Do I really want to know the answer? Right. So feet, torso, arms and hands, face. That's the order that you want to start to look at cues because we control our face better than any other part of our body. Okay? What you also want to pay attention to auditorily are what we call non-fluencies or uh, paralanguage. Do they, do they normally talk very eloquently, very smoothly? You ask a question, does their tone go up a little bit? Do they start to speed up or slow down when you're, when you're talking to them? Now, remember, if they're excited, they'll tend, they'll tend to go up too, right? So we have to always look in terms of what's going on in the environment, right? Now, there are three categories of lies. Lies of falsification, which are the ones that we really hate. Lies of influence and lies of omission. Okay? Not every lie that we run into will be a lie of falsification directly. The most, the most powerful pervasive lies are lies of influence. Lies of influence are an attempt to dissuade you from your line of communication by misleading you or misrepresenting or manipulating your perception of the person. So you may ask um, a janitor, maybe, uh, maybe you have a, a high-rise apartment somewhere and you, you go in one day and you notice all of your jewelry is missing. And the only person up there was the maid. She's in her 50s or 55, 60 years old. You call the police, the police start to ask around. 
And uh, they, were, they approached the maid and they say, uh, you were the only one in the apartment. Um, did you see anything? No, I didn't see anything. Did you take the jewels? Sir, I have been a maid in this apartment for 55 years. I retire next year. Why would I do anything to jeopardize my pension? Oh. Liar. That's right. She didn't answer the question. And what did she do? She went to her reputation. She deflected and had you focus on why she couldn't possibly be that person rather than just saying, no, I didn't take a shit. You get it? These things will jump out at you all the time. But many times they're delivered so smoothly and, and they make so much sense, right? That we just go along. We, get, we allow ourselves to be deflected by this, right? So how many people here are familiar with the, the NLP meta model? Okay, if you really want to get good at pissing people off and provoking stress responses, learn the NLP meta model because it's about learning how to be very, very specific and calling people on their bullshit. Okay? The meta model. Yeah. Most of us, when we talk about hypnotic language, we talk about Ericksonian language patterns or NLP language patterns, and that's the Milton model, based on the idea of Milton Erickson. But when we start to meta model, when we start to ask very, very targeted, very, very specific questions, especially if we do this without a lack of, without a, a set of rapport, you will see people twitch. They will get very defensive very, very quickly. Okay? And it gives you a nice basic set of skills to, to start to probe. Yes, sir? <laughs> okay. Um, What's the first of lies? Of lies of falsification. Lies of influence. And lies of omission. Okay? Lies of omission. Omission is I just... What's that? A lie of omission is when they just leave a piece of information out. Right? They don't, you don't know, don't ask, don't tell, kind of a thing. So they will, they, will, they will give you most of the information, but they will omit certain pieces that would allow you to find out what they did or what, what actually happened. Right? Um, in fact, if you ever, uh, if you read the book Spy Lie, which I believe we have right over here, um, for those of you who want to raid Amazon, right, Spy the Lie, really, really good book. I really enjoyed this book. Uh, another book that you want to you want to focus on is called Telling Lies by Dr. Paul Ekman. Spy the Lie, and it's by uh, Phil Houston, Michael Floyd, and Susan Carnicero. Um, anything by Stan Tennant is very very good. He is actually a professional kinesic interview and interrogation instructor. I, I studied his work uh, intensely. Uh, so what's the, what's the best book on lies? The best book on lies, the Bible. No. Um, <laughs> Was that politically incorrect? <laughs> no, uh, the best book on lies, I think, I think that really depends. I'll tell you what I, what I really liked. Um, and this was, um, I'm just kidding about the Bible. I read it all the time. <laughs> I'm trained in Stanislavski. Telling Lies is a really good book. It's a good primer. Very, very good book. I've had this, obviously, I've had this for a while. Right? Um, Stan, uh, Stan B. Walters also has a really good little home study course called Practical Kinesic Interview and Interrogation, a Pocket Guide. It also comes with some CDs. Okay. I'm sorry, what? This is called Practical Kinesic Interview and Interrogation, the Pocket Guide. Now, I, again, remember, we're, most of us are not going to be in a situation where we're going to sit there and grill somebody. This, I don't, I think he has a website. It looks old. This is kind of old. Well, I'm kind of old. Yeah. This one is Stan B. Walters. Stan also has a YouTube channel, which I highly recommend. Okay? You guys can pass it around, so you guys pass it around so you get all these things. Um, there are millions and millions of body language cues. Hundreds of them. Thousands of them. Okay? The range of body language is as diverse as the people in on the planet, even though they fall within certain patterns. But once we understand the big picture, and that's where I'm kind of going with this. In two hours, I give you just enough to get you in trouble. Right? If we understand, when we look at a dynamic, if I'm talking to this gentleman and we're face to face, we're, we're good, right? 
But remember, the reptile brain runs towards pleasure and away from pain. If I'm really into this conversation, I'm really connected with him, what am I going to do? Without, in that non-gay way, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some way to metaphorically or physically close the distance between us, right? He asks something that makes me, ha makes me have to think and dissociate from the interaction. I'm going to physically or metaphorically distance myself from the interaction. Does that make sense? If I can't distance myself, I'm going to impose a barrier. A barrier can be an arm, an appendage. It can be a torso turn. It can be an object. You will see this many times. Uh, it's also a dating, uh, a, a very powerful dating uh, concept when I teach what I call the seven stages of attraction. One of the things that's constantly happening uh, in that dynamic is the woman, by the way, is leading the dance through most of the mating dance. Guys, in case you didn't know that. Duh. Right? In fact, if you understand the seven stages, there's only two times a guy actually has to do it, that actually has to do something, and if he does it at the right time, you can wind up in an interesting place. Anyway, <laughs> but what happens is when two people get together, um, you'll literally see if this is a wine glass and she has a wine glass, as she turns and orients towards him, she will subtly move something of hers towards the person called the reaching stage or the touching stage. If you are aware of that and mirror it back at the same time, or within, a, within that five second window, click. Combo. Every woman in the place is going, <laughs> guys are going, huh? Because <laughs> we're stupid, we are, we're just dumb that way. Um, but if for some reason, um, I need to get away from this person, right? I'm going to put an object right in front. Some people will do this. Um, when they're, when you can always, always tell when they're going to be defensive or they're, they're not sure about you yet because they'll turn their chair around and do this. Okay? Now I like to do this just because I like that little screen. Some people wear sunglasses. But remember, any symbolic barrier is an indication of a, I'm not ready to trust you yet. I'm not ready to open up to you yet. Right? So we start to see things like what we call the triple cross, which is again the same idea this is my natural laid back David position. You ask me a question that's a little problematic and I go, well, let me see. How many body language cues was that? Three. Three? What were they? Uh, foot, lips, eyes. Yes. And head gesture because you actually right. your head. I turned a little bit, I, I backed up a little bit, I crossed my legs. I, I did actually lift my lower lip, didn't I? Good catch. Yes, did. Right? Now, Obviously, I've gone from a very relaxed state to a more pensive state, right? I'm in that little bit of a, okay, where's he going with this kind of a thing? Now, that could be a flag for you. Where do you want to go with it, right? Where do you want to go with it? He asked me another question, and all of a sudden I go, ah, let's see, where was I last Tuesday night? Uh, now, what, was the, what, what were the cues? Eyes. Eyes, okay. Body turn, biting my lip, okay. What did I do with my voice? Omission tone. I repeated the question. Liars will almost always repeat your question. Especially if you catch them by surprise. Yes. Yes. That's why I'm being very, very global. Is there any difference in terms of, global, of culture and gender? Yes, there are two sets of body language characteristics that I work with. I focus on one, which are the, what I call global. Every human being on the planet exhibits them. Therefore, whether I'm in New Guinea or New York, well, maybe not New York, but um, they're going to be universal, <laughs> right? And that's what I'm teaching you here. The, the, a lot of these things, um, like, you know, just how, you know, in Germany, you, you ask, you know, show the number three on your hand, they do this, right? We do it like this, cultural. I don't worry about those right at first. Why? They're not global. I need something that, I can, that I, I, is my foundation, that if I go anywhere on the planet, I can start to uh, decode what's going on. Does that make sense? So anytime you get a metaphorical or symbolic obstruction is an indicator of, OK, something's weird. I don't, I don't know what's going on here. Doesn't mean they're lying. It means they're defensive, though. And defensiveness is a prelude to lying, more often than not. OK? Um, there are actually 
15 traits that I'm going to share with you now. Um, I call them the Hansen 15. Uh, because they were actually taught to me by a man named Jason Hansen, who's an ex-CIA operative. He runs a website called uh, Spy Escape and Evasion. Um, very, very cool stuff. But everything that I'm sharing with you now presupposes, it assumes, that A, you're in control of your state, you're focusing primarily on what's not matching up in their story. You're, you're, you're ignoring what's true. Got it? You're tuned in and you're sighted in. You're paying attention to what they're doing visually and what they're, what, what's coming out of their mouth. That being said, these things will tend to jump out at you. Okay? The first is called the freeze. I'm talking, I'm being all Italian, all, you know, and I'm chucking and jiving. You ask me a question, you go, what do you mean? It's called the, literally, the freeze. They will literally stop moving. Okay. Yes, sir. So is asking somebody to repeat the question just a significant? Yes. The because what are they trying to do? They're trying to delay or, or, or buy time. Right? Now, in my course, um, we actually take repeating, uh, repeating somebody's words back to a whole other level. Right? We're not necessarily lying, but we are actually uh, accessing their neurological passcode. And it goes right into their, into their limbic system, and they start to feel really connected. But that's a different agenda in a different class, um, they won't touch you or want you touching them. So let's say that, that you know, I'm hanging out with my bud here, right, and you know, he asks me a question and I go, what do you mean? And he goes to step next to me and I kind of you know, get that don't touch me kind of an energy, just kind of stay back kind of an energy that many times. Again, if you don't have a baseline, you're not going to pick this up. If you're focused on the story they're telling you, rather than looking for the discrepancies, you'll miss it. You'll get sucked into the story. That's the power of stories. I'm going to show you some really cool story trick at the end. Because if you really want to catch a liar, have them tell you their story. And then ask them to tell it to you backwards. They can't do it. No one can do it. Um, now someone says, I can do that. Eyes, they stare too hard. So you start to, because remember, we're taught that we can't, a liar can't look you in the eyes. So what's your name again, sir? David. David? I'm looking at David. And uh, David asked me a question, and I'm going to lie, and, I go, and ask me a question. Like, what's my name? How old are you? How old am I? I'm 17. <laughs> See my eyes change? <laughs> see the hard, the hard I'm going to get your ass stare, right? When you see that, that you're going to challenge me, motherfucker, stare? <laughs> right? That's what I mean. And that is actually one of the defense mechanisms that many times a liar will use, not just the stare, but all the other behaviors that go with it. They know that if, if you ask them a question and, and you don't believe them, that if they get a, give you a strong enough angry outburst, that it will scare you into dropping the subject. Could you demonstrate that again? Fuck you! <laughs> that, no, that, was, no. that was three. <laughs> Pardon my French. I'm sure everybody who's in the sound of this microphone just got really offended. But the whole, so ask me the question. Okay, so how old are you? I'm 17. Okay. And, and then it's like you're trying to stare me down. Yeah. No. See, I'm holding that stare. It's, a very, it's very hard, mm -hmm. right? It's like there's this wall here. It's like you're going to believe me, right? Gotcha. right? I'm exaggerating a lot. But the eyes are very expressive. Okay. Many times, any, does everybody here know the difference between a, a fault, how to detect a false smile versus a real smile? Yeah. Raise your hands if you do know. If you don't, I will, I'm going to explain it. Okay. There's this thing we call a Duchesne smile. It's an organic, natural smile. Best place to see this in action is watching politicians and actors when they're going in and out of places. Because you'll see this. And there's nothing from the nose up. When you see an actual legitimate, happy to see you, I'm in a good place, smile. The little crow's feet around the orbital bones and around the uh, zygomatic bone, actually, will crinkle. That's when you know you've got a legitimate smile. Okay? Unless they've had way too much Botox. <laughs> which means they're really lying. Okay? Uh, going back to something we talked about earlier, never accuse a person of lying directly, okay? More often than not, we need to warm up the pot before we throw the, before we throw the you know, frog in there, 
right? Or we'll put the frog in the pot and then warm up the bowl, right? We have to ask questions that are, in some cases, very tangential, very oblique, sometimes even allegorical or metaphorical. Um, one of the things that they talked about a lot, you guys want more, kind of, yeah, let's pass these around. You guys probably need a little brain sugar. It's all good. I noticed that most of the dark chocolate is already gone. You're doing it to me, aren't you? You guys have fun with this? Is this good stuff? Okay, cool. Because if not, we'll all get up and do the hula dance or something. I think I have a twister game in my room somewhere. We'll play twister. Um, people squint. And actually, I did that with this gentleman here. When he, uh, when he and I were talking, first I gave him the hard, the hard stare, and then I, then I went like this. When they squint like that, a lot of times they're being deceptive. And again, we're presupposing that we've done all of our homework first. We're presupposing we're controlling our state. We're focusing on the, on the, the inconsistencies, and we're looking for clusters, right? Any of these show up within a five second window, good chance they're being deceptive, right? But then you have to make a decision. What am I gonna do about it? What am I gonna do about it? Sometimes the worst thing is knowing somebody's lying to you and being unwilling to do something about it, right? Um, that's a different, different issue, but um, you need them to be comfortable. This is why I like, I, I, this is the first time when I taught lie detection that I've actually taught people the three magic questions protocol in this context. Normally I reserve that for, uh, I work with a company called Next Trial Innovations. We're a relatively new company, but we specifically work with personal injury attorneys and jury consulting and things like that. Um, this is such a power, we literally have video. When you utilize the three magic questions protocol and the, and the state control stuff I started with, we literally have people, expert witnesses on video, waving their attorney-client privilege to talk to my, my clients. Okay, now, for those of you who are in the legal profession, you know that's a big deal. Okay, it's that powerful. And it's not just a one-off. We have had several, several situations where that's occurred. So even though it seems very basic, the three magic questions and this whole matching, mirroring, state control thing, it is profound. If you really want to get in that, start with Amy, Pow Amy, Amy Cuddy's Power Poses, and then get a book called Honest Signals. Honest Signals. Okay? And it's actually not on lie detection, but it is on nonverbal influence and, and group dynamics. So, for, for the lady here who does the security work, yes, that is going to be bre uh, a gold mine for you in terms of what to look for uh, when people are, are trying to gain access. Oh. No worries. No worries. Um, do we need a break? Or you, you guys want to keep going? Okay, all right. <laughs> Why to argue? All right. So, uh, honest signals and then power cues, which is an, ext an extrapolation on the, the information in honest signals. Power cues actually has, for those of you who do a lot of storytelling work, uh, Power cues has a great primer on how to tell very compelling stories as well as the, the, the primary archetypal themes that people find the most persuasive. Okay? So it's really a good resource for those of you who are going to do a lot of story work, Ericksonian based, metaphors, things like that. Or if you're going to create your own. That, that was the honest, signals. honest signals and then power cues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's by uh, Sand Sandy Penland, I think is the term. I'll, I'll look at it later. Uh, let me just go through the rest of these. Liars put objects between you and them. We just covered this. They're gonna, when somebody's trying to be deceptive, when somebody's trying to create space, they're going to find a way to put something between us. Right? It's protection. It's safety. Most of the things that a liar is doing that indicate he's being deceptive within the context of clustering and, and uh, baselining, are designed to soothe him. They're ways of venting stress. And the harder you try to lock down the stress in your body, the more it starts, it's like steam. It seeps out in different places. We spend the most of our time covering our face because that's where we're looking. But if we go further down the chain, we start to pay less and less attention. You start to get more and more leakage, and more and more flags will become available that allow you to decide to, what the heck? All righty then. That was weird. Uh, that will allow you to, to really decide how deep down this you want to go, okay? Uh, their hands shake. 
if they go to shake their hand, or, or maybe if you finished an interview, and, they're, and, and their hands are shaking. Yeah, yeah literally shaking. Um, or head shake, I'm sorry, head shake. Uh, this is cool. Actually, Nixon did this. Anybody ever watch any of the videos of Nixon? I am not a crook. Right? You guys remember that video clip or that film clip? When did the head not happen? He said, I am not a crook. It happened after. Many times when somebody is verbally denying at the same time they're physiologically denying, when they're being honest, when they're being truthful, the nod will happen first or at the same time as the verbal denial. Many times when they're being deceptive, because they have to consciously track all these things, they'll give the verbal denial and then the head nod within a five second window. Follow me? Okay. That's a, that's a pretty interesting one, I always thought. Um, interesting about Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> How did he get away? Because he was a master of rapport. Clinton is legendary for being able to just put the whammy on you. Do you think he also studied the whatever? Oh, sure. Whatever. They all do. Like he can tell each Yeah. Well, you guys know what the Clinton, the Clinton stare is, right? It's a body language technique that he perfected to like deadly extreme. He would, you know, if, if I'm going to, hi, my name is Bill Clinton. Nice to meet you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I said, boom. What happened when I look back? I'm still staring. I know, right? <laughs> the, the, the stare is like, hi, I'm, I'm David Snyder. Nice to meet you. Oh, he looks back. Yeah. It, it just nails you. Yeah. yeah, right? Now, there's another body language tactic that I'm using. It's called the open heart trust trigger, which I only found in a book on how to, on, on, by, written for women on how to seduce men. <laughs> and I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that that's fair. <laughs> that was the test. I told you there would be a test. <laughs> By the way, that it actually where Three Magic Questions came from was actually that same, uh, the same book I'm, I'm, I'm referencing that was written for women to hypnotize men into going out with them. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to know? <laughs> it's called Love Trances by Craig Ravinsky. Best book I have ever read on practical, real-world hypnotic attraction techniques. It is not fair. <laughs> Was written for women, though. So I had to tweak it. I had to change it just a little bit for men to be able to use it, too. Because <laughs> that's fair. Right? I have whole workshops. If you go to my YouTube channel, David Snyder at YouTube.com, uh, I have over 70 videos, and they're not small videos. Just loaded with content on everything from lie detection to advanced attraction skills for men and women, uh, how to heal a broken heart, how to uh, you know, catch a liar, fix heal pain, law of attraction stuff. We have a, reminds me I have a gift for you guys. Remind me before I, I let you all run off to the, uh, out into the world. I have actually two free gifts. One of which has to do with those cards in your hand. Okay. Uh, the other one is, I shouldn't even give you because you're just, but you all showed up today and you ate my candy. Of course, you're going to leave the milk chocolate for me, aren't you? Yeah. You're just going to leave that shit. I know. <laughs> all right. All right. Extreme overreaction. We talked about this. You ask somebody a question and they just go nuts. They just, how dare you accuse me of lying, blah, blah, blah. When you see an out of proportion emotion like that, big red flag should be going off like gangbusters, okay? The, 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 the objective behind that kind of behavior is if they raise enough of a stink, you'll drop the subject. Ladies, you do this, right? No. No, you don't do that. Oh, here's a little body language tip. When women get stressed out, this is a gender study. When women get stressed out, they get more specific. When men get stressed out, they get more global. This is why when you get home from work and she's pissed off, it's because you left the toothpaste lid open. You're like, what? And the seat up. <laughs> All right. Um, and, the, and it's not, it's not a, a cultural thing. It's a neurological thing. 
right? So if you know your wife or your, your husband's baseline, and they come home, and you can tell they're stressed, match their, sort, their, their information sorting system. If you know they're going to be global, don't get all specific and go into ultra detail about, you know, the bills and this, that, and the other thing. He's not in the place to hear it. Same thing, guys, when you get home and she's pissed off about the toilet seat lid, don't blow it off. Okay? <laughs> How many people here are interested in conversational hypnosis? Okay. There's a really sneaky way that you can use conversational hypnosis to help spot a liar. You guys know what an embedded command is? Okay. An embedded command. One of the things you can do, and you got to remember, when you deliver embedded commands, you've got to use at least three of them. Because it's based on the neurology uh, isolating and determining a pattern. But you can literally uh, tell, the un tell the unconscious mind that whenever it's going to lie, to do something. Like, I'm not suggesting that you're going to stiffen whenever you lie. You know. <laughs> because stiffening up whenever you lie, you know, and you know, all of a sudden they go to lie and like, right. just an idea, just a thought. I don't know. <laughs> is this something you want to, how long does that suggestion, the question was, how long does that suggestion stay with you and do you want to do that with a spouse? You know? No, I'm not asking you to do this. What are you asking again so I know, I get the question right. So, I mean, let's take for instance employees, mm -hmm. students, people like that, and we're here in a controlling environment, and first day or whatever, and, and you make those suggestions, are those suggestions going to be uh, acted upon a year, two years, three years down the line? They could be. When you're Depends on how much they're reinforced, in my opinion. A lot of people, there's a lot of contentions. How long do post hypnotics actually last? My instructor, Jerry Kine, says that they last as long as, the, as, long as they're, um, until somebody goes in or removes them. Um, but I've seen suggestions not, not manifest over a period of time. I think a lot of it has to do with the state in which the, the trigger, the anchor was set. And I think a lot of it also is to do with how many times it's actually activated and reinforced. How often do you get something that bumps up against it? How yeah. countervailing yep. influence True. will eat it away eventually? Yeah. So the more I think going to what this gentleman says is you know, how much resistance or how many other things that go against it, how much, how much conscious energy are they going to expend overriding that, right, if they know the suggestion is there or they know that they're doing it. How, how many times is the, is the suggestion actually triggered so that it manifests? That was one of the things we've seen a lot is when you give somebody a post-hypnotic many times, when, when you actually create the suggestion, they're very kind of slow and lethargic to respond at first, and then the more times you have them do it, the more rapidly the behavior starts to generalize and become more, more consistent. So I think a lot of it has to do with how, how often that, that particular suggestion is fired. So maybe, maybe it's permanent. If they're chronic liars, man, you could be, you know, divorced really quick. What's that bad command you said? Sorry? What's that bad command you said? Oh, the, oh uh, it might be something like, you know, some people stiffen up whenever you lie, kind of a thing. Uh, do you know what embedded commands are? Yeah, I do. Okay. So, so, so to up. Yeah, so he might, he might. If you lie. Yeah, yeah. And if we, remember, when we, remember, when we deliver embedded commands, you got to do it at least three times. And there has to be a strong downward tonality. And don't worry, you won't get caught. I've tried to get caught. I have done things at drive throughs that would, I can't even say that on camera. Because uh, people are just droning. Remember that little four, that little four square model? In, internal, external, associated, dissociated? Most people that you will run into are internal dissociated. They're in their own head, completely disconnected. They're going through their laundry list, their soccer, their soccer schedule, everything but being in the moment. So in order to, it's an opportunity for a, co a covert hypnotist many times because there's no recall pathway and you can just load suggestions in there if you know how to do it peripherally, right? Yes, sir. Uh, is, it, is there actually, uh, is it a good thing to try to bring the person in a different state of what it, they, they are actually? When they start to lie, they have all this build up, you know, and then Yes, fine. actually it's a good question. Is it good to bring somebody into a different state? If someone is in a pissed off defensive mode already, all right, it's going to be hard for me to, to, to tell, I'm just, I'm just going to put more wood on that fire if I don't get them into a stable, steady state that I can use to, to, to mark deviance. 
And it goes back to this whole thing of Othello's flaw. Many times when people get very, very stressed out, scared, defensive, they will exhibit what we interpret as deceptive cues. And they're not being deceptive. They just have hyper-responsiveness to, to the environment or, this, or the context. So many times you have to really be careful, you know, really double check yourself when you're going to start provoking stress and, and looking for deception indicators. Does that make sense? Okay. No, you know, first of all, once you make the decision that you're going to dig, you've got to be like a bulldog, right? You've got to control your state, focus on the baseline, go into what they call L-squared mode, which is auditory visual. We're only looking for deception. We're not looking for what, anything that's true in what they say. We have to completely disregard it. We have to only focus on what is not matching up. And like a pit bull, just keep digging, right? And be, open, and be okay with whatever answers we get. Yes, sir? Since we're in Vegas, my interest in coming here was to do better at poker, but everything you listed, you can't see them playing poker. You got sunglasses. I know, they cover themselves up. Poker is not about, oh, he came here to learn how to, how to get better at poker. Uh, there's a great bunch of books out. Uh, remind me after the class. I'll write it on the board or I'll send it out in an email. Um, there's a great set of books by a former FBI body language expert specifically on, on poker tales. But the feet are under the table. I don't mm -hmm. think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're going to have to look for even subtler cues. Some, some people might tap their glasses when, they're, when they're, they've got a good one. Some people might hold their hand. In, if one, one hand, they might hold them the cards one way when they have a good hand. They might hold them in a different hand. They might put their cards down when they know they have a good hand. Or right. they might raise it. I mean, right. Yeah, and you're looking for deviations from the baseline. But remember, a professional poker player, they're designed to minimize those tells, right? So you've got to get super, super micro. That's where micro expression training for you. And if you're going to, because that's where that stuff will come out. The grief, the, the, the anger, the joy, they'll flash. Can a person pick up micro expression? Yes. Paul Ekman at paulekman.com has a complete set of software that you can buy, or I think you can even use it on his website, that will train you on how to spot micro expressions. You're welcome. PaulEckman.com. Micro expressions. If you're gonna, if, if you're, if you're dealing in an environment where people have facial, like sunglasses in there, or maybe beards or whatever, uh, micro expressions are a great way to identify when people are masking emotion. Okay, but they happen very, very quickly. So the software is, is, is actually very good. There's also a set of books he put out. One is called the Facial Action Coding System. Paul Ekman uh, consults very, very frequently with a lot of uh, security companies, FBI, TSA, CIA, those kind of things. Right. So he's very, I, I have a tremendous, tremendous amount of uh, respect for Paul Ekman's work. In fact, um, in, uh, in my conversational hypnosis class on Sunday, I'll be talking about a phenomenon called the emotional refractory period, which Ekman discovered, which is tremendously, tremendously powerful in understanding how people are going to parse your language what, and what behaviors are likely to generate and actually how to install non-verbally in people filters that cause them to think about what you said in a way that's more useful for you getting your outcome. It's a really cool phenomenon. We do it neurologically, so it happens at random and by default. But when you understand how it works and you have the state control stuff we play with and some of the other things, you have tremendous, tremendous leverage on the human body. I've got a question. You know, people that are I think of as pathological liars mm -hmm. always tell stories that you know they didn't do that shit. Yep. <laughs> what are you trying to say? Did you have to confront them to start to get the, the defensive? Do you have to confront them? No, you don't have to confront anybody. No, no, no. no. I, mean, I mean in order to see the, 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 the defensive stress. Well, actually... Because they're I'll... used to just telling you stories constantly. Mm -hmm. But are they, are they probably going to be... I, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple people that I can't... The question is, do they believe their story? If they believe their story, in their mind, they're not lying. Right? This goes go back to the whole Stanislavski thing. If you're congruent, if you believe in what you're saying, whether the information you're conveying is true or not, you're not lying. You're telling lies, but in your world, you're not lying. But for those of you who ever get a chance to see somebody's handwriting, did you know people who have a tendency to be deceptive actually have a particular handwriting trait that sometimes shows up? You don't want to know that, do you? <laughs> All right. The, uh, the, the trait is in the O. Okay. It's best isolated in the cursive O. 
Now remember, just because the trait shows up doesn't mean they're lying to you then, and it doesn't actually mean that they're lying, but that the probability that they're going to engage in deception is higher than normal. So one of the things that we look about at when we look at handwriting traits is the O. If, there's, if they make an O like this, the direction of the loop indicates where the behavior is oriented towards. Anything that moves to the left in terms of our handwriting, and by the way, this seems to generalize into other aspects of the nervous system as well. Anything that moves to the left is towards self. Uh, anything that moves to the right is other. Yes? And left-handed, does that make sense? Nope. Handed doesn't matter. Does it change? Yeah, I mean, you know, no, I, have, I haven't found any correlation with the NLP timelines. Although you find out a lot of times people put a lot of their past on this side, on their left. Yes, sir? Uh, sort of off the handwriting, if you adopt the traits of like, all the traits you want, does it become... You can overwrite them, yes. Now, the question was, if you adopt traits of people whose handwriting, if you adopt the handwriting traits of people you like or who you admire, can you change it? Yes. The term is called graphotherapy. And Everything that our nervous system expresses, it expresses on multiple levels simultaneously. Okay? Uh, in the world according to David, you'll find a lot of analogies. It goes to a, a studies in what we call embodied cognition and uh, object relations theories. Uh, these are all neurosciences, but if, for instance, just uh, to go off on a little bit of a tangent, what's your name again? Paula. If, if I wanted Paula to actually feel more warmly towards me, and I gave her a warm drink to hold, she would actually start to process emotional warmth the same way she processes physical warmth. We can actually change how she perceives and filters me through the objects in the environment. Okay? When people are sorting timelines or playing with time, I have noticed more often than not, whether you, go, whether you reference metaphysical systems or more the neuroscience, self almost always tends to be to the left. They don't have to drink it, right? Nope, they just gotta hold it. They just got to hold it. Yes, sir? Uh, doesn't have something to do also with the way people have learned, you know, cursive writing? Like, for instance, in Europe, uh, no one uh, learned to write, you know, uh, like in the U.S., it's always cursive writing. Mm -hmm. So you're taught to actually write every letter a very specific way. Mm -hmm. And uh, if someone uh, actually drawing all like the one on the left, uh, would, I mean, wouldn't pay the right here, we would have to be with the whole, uh, with the loop on the right. Okay, I, I lost the question somewhere in there. So, so is that something... You're, you're, you're saying that people in Europe are taught to write a very specific, very regimented way. If that were actually true, now maybe, maybe, they may be taught that way, but I guarantee your handwriting looks very different from your classmates' handwriting. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Because how you express that standardized is based on, how, on the parts of your nervous system that you use and the way you process information. Yes? I didn't mean to adopt the handwriting trait. I mean, like, let's say there's a trait of people who are creative, their handwriting. If you adopt those handwriting traits, will it make you more creative? Yes. Yes. I was, I, I actually I answered the question right. I just didn't hear the question. Yes, it's called graphotherapy. And literally, you can change anything about yourself. I call it the backdoor principle. Okay? You can do it through your neurology, through your handwriting, by changing the, the individual traits in your handwriting. It takes about 21 to 30 days. Not, well, I, I would go 90 days, but. 21 to 30 days is, is usually a good window. You can literally change everything about you. Okay? But you've got to do it a lot. So which one is deceptive? They're both deceptive. The bigger the loop, the bigger the possibility. Of, and actually, it's not deception, it's secrecy. The bigger the loop? The bigger the loop, the oh, bigger the drive. Yes. Yes. Just, I'm a handwriting analyst, and usually it's double loops that are... I haven't gotten that one yet. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Yeah. yeah. The double loop, which is what this gentleman's... Is, is when you see this. Now, sometimes that loop will close. Sometimes it won't. If the loop doesn't close, they're going to lie to themselves. They're going to lie to you, and they're going to let everybody know about it. Right? <laughs> right? If, if the loops link then when they talk to you, they may let everybody know about it, but they, these people don't know what the truth is, and they don't care. Okay? Now, when you start sorting for people's handwriting, you start looking for this trait, you have to look at how many times does the letter O actually appear in the sample. 
based on how many times the letter O actually appears in the sample, how many times does one of these suckers show up? The percentage gives you roughly how dominant or how active that particular trait is in them at any given moment. Okay? I can't remember the guy's name. Ford, when he signed off on that report about Kennedy's assassination, mm -hmm. his signature was remarkably different than yes. what he normally signed off on other pieces of mm -hmm. documents. Mm -hmm. Would that be an indication he's being deceptive? When he was or he's there? in an extremely different emotional state than he normally is. One of the things I have noticed, there's a trait uh, to what you were saying, uh, and this gentleman was talking about when Gerald Ford signed the, what was it, the, the pardon or the? The report that Congress finally passed clarifying the assassination of, of JFK, right? Um, his signature was markedly different. Remember, your physiology controls your psychology. If your mind is in a certain state, your neurology changes. It can't not happen. That's where the basis of handwriting analysis, graph analysis, and all the things we're learning about, it all comes together. As your psycho-emotional state changes, how you use your body changes. As, you, how you, as how you use your body changes, your brain changes. Your emotions change. It's a feedback loop, okay? If you're someone who has just finished a very, very intense research project, and your handwriting is normally this big, Chances are, if I, if I ask you to do me a handwriting sample after you've just finished that very, very intense research project where you have to focus and concentrate, it'll look something like this. It will dramatically shrink. Some traits in handwriting are transient. They change as your state changes. Some are more consistent. Right? But this is what I've noticed. If you want to be able to concentrate more, write smaller. Asians love writing small. I'm married to one, I know. I need reading glasses for my reading glasses. But this is a trait that's pretty consistent. I've been a big fan of handwriting and analysis for many, many years. It has never not served me, and it has almost never been wrong. So as a hypnotist, as a hypnotherapist, ask your clients to write some stuff for you. You get a little snapshot into their psychology and what they're most likely to do in any given situation or scenario. Yes? The way the kids are writing nowadays, mm -hmm. they're all printing and yes. texting. It's harder. Getting away from the, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're developing, a system, we're, we're developing a culture now that is becoming more and more dissociated. We're replacing real connections with the illusions of connections. And so a lot of the things that we rely on from a more organic age, a little bit more challenging now. Right? So did everybody hear her question? Yes. Why does it mean left to right? If, it's, if the loop is on the right side of the O, it's towards other people. So if, if somebody asked me what I did yesterday, I'm more likely to say, well, why do you want to know? I will answer a question with a question. I won't just say, well, I went shopping or I stayed at home. I would say, well, why do you want to know? That's where your, just, your defensive behaviors will tend to manifest. The bigger the loop, the more dominant and energetic the trait. Follow me? Okay. Smaller loops, small drives. Big loops, big drives. Big imagination. Make sense? By the way, if we understand that loop size is equivalent to how big their imagination is and how strong it, by the, the length of a, of a loop or a stem is, is determined strength of a drive or a trait, if it's a loop, the size of it is how big the imagination is, how suggestible they are. That doesn't say that they're deceptive. No. It just says that there, is no there is no cue that says deception. It's only when these things happen in, in the context of a specific topic. The big, yes. Yeah, the the big, yeah, they have this ability. They have this tendency to do this. But if people are writing something that is fraudulent, you can probably bet that that will show up more because the trade is being activated. Yes? You touched on it briefly, but you talked about a lot of people are printing nowadays, not doing cursive. So yeah, it's harder. It's harder. People who print tend to be a little bit more defensive anyway. They have a little bit more need for privacy. But now because of our, because everything is, te is text now, we're just defaulting to block letters and things like that. But a lot of times you'll see, you'll see handwritten cursive intermixed with printing. And that actually means something too. For those of you who want to really study the handwriting stuff, uh, look up Bart Baggett stuff, yeah. They tend to be a little bit more intuitive. People who, who intersperse 
uh, when, the, when, the, when printing and cursive kind of intermix in a communication. It tends to show a little bit more of an intuitive side. They tend to get feelings about people that later turn out to be true. What is Bart Baggett, B-A-G-G-E-T-T. He's out of, he used to be out of uh, Texas, now he's, uh, I think he's in LA, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, so, uh, so that's something you can look at in handwriting. I, I had a hypnosis client when I lived in Oklahoma. He was a good friend of mine too, and, and, and I, he came to me to do a session, and he wrote some stuff out for me, and I saw, I saw these massive, and there, there was drama following this guy everywhere he went, and I could never figure out why, because he was the sweetest, nicest guy. And I look at his handwriting, and it's like this. The loops are just everywhere. And I was like, okay. I said, and you gotta be careful with those guys, right? Or girls. Because they don't know what the truth is. Half the time, they're making it up as they go. And they don't care. They will tell you what's ever on their mind at the beginning of the moment. So the loops are in the writing and not just in the O? The, no, the loops have to be in the O. The O is specific to deception or secretiveness. Loops in other places indicate other things. Right? If people want to know more about handwriting, um, I'm happy to, you know, maybe next time of thoughts we'll do a breakout on handwriting or something like that. Or uh, if you guys want to come to my website or something, I'll, I'll put some stuff up on handwriting. Uh, because in my profiling, when I teach covert hypnosis, which is really social influence on steroids, I spend a lot of time on profiling other people, knowing, figuring out what meta programs they're working with, how to speed read them, cold read them, yes. No, I have not. I have never bothered to, to really. Uh, by the way, not can, writing, but I mean the, the, I'm not aware of any stu any studies to that effect. Uh, but it's a good it's a good it's a good idea. Yeah. What if there are no loops? Doesn't mean this trait doesn't exist. It just means it's not in their handwriting. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, let me finish this list real quick. Can I ask a quick question? You can ask a quick question. Yes. You have a friend that uh, is really a mess, but he's a nice guy. What if you tell him stop writing with loops? I didn't know to do that then, <laughs> and I didn't know how to bring it up to say, "Look, dude, you're so much, you're, you're borderline psychotic. You don't know what reality is, and you don't really care." I think if you stop writing this way, you know, reality would change. Yeah, not so much. But I think, if, yeah, I think if you know that you have, by the way, the problem with this is that they don't care. When they have, and I, I find myself a lot of times when I'm going through a transition phase where I'm moving from one set of behaviors to another, like I'm doing self-work, I'll have these little loops show up for a little while. Where I'm like, part of me knows what's true, there's another part that's like, no, you ain't changed yet, dickhead, right? And, and, and then it'll go away, right? So, um, so these things can change. It, I, I, we would, none of us would be in this room if we felt that there was any part of human behavior, human personality that couldn't be changed. The question is, is it worth the time, energy, and effort to get whatever degree of change we can? And that's something that we as therapists and, and hypnotists have to make a decision. You know, there, I firmly believe that anybody who walks into my door can be hypnotized. They don't have to believe in anything I tell them. All they have to do is do it. All they got, your job is not to get belief from your clients. Your job is to get compliance. Because if they do what you say, they'll get the change. If they don't do what you say, they don't get the change. Does that make sense? My stuff isn't based on belief, okay? Otherwise, I wouldn't have many clients. <laughs> but anyway, so let me just go through this. We have a few left. Hiding the mouth or the eyes. Many times when people begin to become deceptive, there's part of them that's a little bit ashamed. They'll cover the mouth, they'll cover the nose, they'll cover the eyes. You now let me think about that. Oh, you know, ever see these gestures, right? You know, I'm sitting here and I'm like, let me, where were you last night? Uh, my daughter, I told you not to, I told you to stop seeing my daughter. I went by her house, your house, I saw her car out front. You weren't there. I know, because I looked. Where were you? Let me think. And inside I'm going, oh shit. Right? Or I'll go, hmm, let me think. Right? Or maybe you'll get this. Where was I last night? <laughs> You see how it all starts to jump out at you, right? But if you're focused on the story, you'll miss the visuals. If you're focusing on the truth, you'll fill in all the gaps. Your rational lying brain, your neocortex will create a plausible 
rationale to, to, to confirm the true parts. Right? Now, if you're already predisposed that this is a lying son of a bitch in front of me, then it doesn't matter what he says. You've already made your decision. Your perceptual filters will shift, and nothing he says will be true. That doesn't help either. You understand? Your goal, when you, when you engage in the act of, of, of tracking down or invoking deception behaviors, is to find out if they're being deceptive. Which means, by definition, you're not convinced either way yet. The same thing happens when we do a lot of kinesi kinesiology and body testing. People, I, I stopped doing kinesiology. I'm a big believer in energetics and vibration and stuff like that. In fact, we have a whole breakout on it this weekend on speed healing and energy hypnosis and things like that. But I stopped doing kinesic testing or kinesiology testing a long time ago because there's too many ways to bias the test. Too many. It's not reliable because if you want it to work in a certain way, you'll overwrite what their nervous system does. Yeah. You'll just overwrite it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and there's many ways to screw with that. So it's not even, you know, as a self test, you have to really separate what you want to be true from real intuition which is another big thing that we have. A lot of people in the hypnosis field are also intuitives. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong because they haven't separated out wishful thinking from actual intuition. They're actually at different spatial locations mediated by the proprioceptive nervous system. Uh, throat clearing. You get somebody, you ask them a question, and the next thing that happens is <coughs> Let me see. How many clusters is that, by the way? There's at least two there, right? Right? I clear my throat, I looked away, I touched my face. Now all that has to happen, I repeat their freaking question, or I bring God into it. Whenever they bring God into it, they're probably lying. That is actually true, by the way. We were actually, we were actually taught that in uh, our Kinesic interview and interrogation class. Anytime they start bringing God, Allah, the Bible into it, red flags should go up. Okay? Doesn't mean they're lying, but it's a high probability that they're getting ready to. Anchor point movement, we talked about this. If, if I'm sitting, you ask me a question and I shift, right? Or I'm standing in a certain way, you ask me a question and I step differently. The anchor points of my body to the earth change. These are all indicators that something happened inside. They're not random, okay? Especially especially if you've been matching and mirroring their physiology the whole time. It is extraordinarily, okay, it is extraordinarily hard when you've done the physiological connection that I'm talking about and alluding to. It is very, very difficult for them to break away. They have to exert a very, very strong effort. They can do it to break that connection in order to lie effectively. It's very compelling. Okay, this is why we started with this stuff. If we could just keep matching the physiology, the systems want to go towards more and more connection, which by definition tends to imply more and more honest communication. Right? It's, it's, it's physics. Um, and I'll, I'll show that video later on this week. Grooming gestures. This is, again, these are soothing gestures many times. You'll see this also in attraction cues. Um, many times when, when uh, someone is actually, when a female is signaling attraction, they'll start playing with their hair, grooming, gestures, things like that, right? In a, in a lie detection context, when people start, we we'll call it self-soothing, when they start grooming themselves, they start distracting themselves with something else, that's exactly what they're doing. They're creating a metaphorical or a symbolic distancing and buying time. So on one level, they're trying to soothe themselves, they're trying to relax themselves. A lot of times, self-stroking, you know, or tapping. These are also soothing or stress dissipation gestures. So we want to become very, very aware of our baseline, of our, first of all, our state, right? We got to get them out of their head and into the world, location, occasion, right? We got to match and mirror their physiology so that the system's in train and it's very hard to pull away. We got to set a baseline. We got to look for clusters. Look for posture, for body orientation, blocking gestures. Do the verbals match the visuals, right? When they say something, within five second window, what do they do? That's the timeliness aspect of it, right? 
Verbally, they're gonna, they're, they're, what's, what's the rate and speed at which they speak? Does it speed up? Does it slow down? Does it only speed up or slow down when certain topics are brought up? Right? These are all things that are going to happen. They're going to happen a lot. They're going to shift very, very quickly. Most of it you will miss because you're not there yet. You know, I, I, I miss stuff all the time, and I've been doing this for 20-some years. But we can always look at people. The best thing is, is you're in Las Vegas. You got human beings everywhere in their natural habitat behaving badly. Okay? Go to the casino and watch these people. Look for the patterns. The one common denominator in every single thing that I do, teach, practice, is based on two words, pattern recognition. When you learn to recognize patterns, the universe will open its secrets to you like a skeleton key to the universe. I, 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 that's, to quote my father, I shit you not. Right? <laughs> When you can see patterns, human beings become very, very predictable. And in our line of work, as reality technicians, that's an extremely useful skill to have. Before I let you go, I have two free gifts for you. One has to do with that card that we handed out. Because you guys came out today, because you sat through my intensely weird lecture on body language, I'm going to give everybody here a free gift. Normally to walk into my clinic or into my office, whether as a coach or a mentor or whatever, it's $175 an hour, I know, I don't charge enough. But, <laughs> what I'd like to do for everyone today, uh, whether you're local in San Diego or across the country, I do a tremendous amount of consults by Skype, I'd like to offer everybody in this room a free, free 30 minute consultation with me. If all you wanna do is talk on the phone and shoot the shit for 30 minutes, we can do that, okay? It's my gift to you. All you gotta do, is A, take one of those cards, write your contact information on it, hand it to the center row, and I'll collect them. And I have one more gift for you. Uh, since I only have five minutes, I gotta speak really fast. I have been running the world's longest ongoing skill building mastermind mentoring program on NLP and hypnosis and other forms of influence and persuasion that exist. It's been going on continuously since 2010. We meet on the third Saturday of every single month. We have since 2010. And I have a long, illustrious history of teaching hypnotists for free, everything they need to know to be successful out there, okay? Uh, we, meet, we get together on Thursday, Saturday every month, and I go, okay, what do you want to learn today? What do you want to learn? What do you want to learn? What do you want to learn? And I write it all on the board. I look, at, I look at everything that's written. I find the connecting threads. I create the lesson plan on the spot. And for the next four hours, I drill you on those skills until you can do them in your sleep. And we videotape every single one of those sessions. Because you were here today, you ate my chocolate, <laughs> asked me really cool questions. I'd like to, we, we, we videotape every session, we archive them on the NLP Power website. For the next 30 days, if you go to nlppower.com, dot com forward slash h t and HTL HTL 2015. I will give you free, full, unfettered access to all five years of those mastermind video archives for 30 days. Which means you can log in and watch and watch and watch, and watch some more. And we have people who do that, okay? Normally, nlppower.com forward slash HTL 2015. Okay? No obligation, there's no, we're not gonna spam you or anything like that, although I'll think about it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I've been doing that with your archives. Oh, you've been on the archives? Yeah, well, I think every morning, or about four or five times a week, we can have a morning breakfast together. Oh, I didn't know that. So we have a, we have a veteran like, who actually accesses the, the... Give her a big round of applause. Uh, some of the people in this room have been to my mastermind. Some have not. Uh, talk to them. How many of you have been to one of my actual trainings? Just raise your hand so I know. If you have been to one of my actual trainings, talk to these people. Uh, I give better stuff away for free than most people charge for. 
Not that I'm arrogant about that at all. But, um, we have one minute left, so I will take whatever questions we have before you guys head out. Um, yes? Uh, yes. Uh, I was told that uh, people actually are much better liars when they are into trance. Any, uh, any recommendation or techniques you can use to prevent them from going into trance? Catch their tells before they go into trance. The, the question was, people lie better in trance. That's true, because your critical factor is gone. What you believe is, is reality isn't the same anymore. So if you're a good liar outside of trance, you're a better liar in one. All right. So you want to you want to actually start to you actually probably have to provoke their critical factor to get them a little bit. I wouldn't even try to detect a lie in trance. I have to assume that the person, unless I'm getting real strong non-verbal contradictions, get strong, strong rapport with them and ask the right questions before you put them in formally. Three magic questions is the most powerful way to do that in a interview or a consult format. All I ask if you had good if you if you had a good time, make sure everybody knows it, right? As if this were one of my meetups. I would say, if you had a great time, post good things to the meetup. If you didn't have a good time, post to somebody else's. <laughs> In this case, if you had a good time, let the people at the front desk know. Let them know what you want more of. Hand those card, one of those cards in, the other one you keep. Do you have any blank cards? Yes, I do. I have lots of them. One of those cards you get to keep. The other one you hand in so I have your contact information for your consultation. So if anybody needs cards, I got them. Thank you, sir. I only need one. You keep it.